examples of the subscales that uh, we're looking at. Uh, we are looking at um, a subscale for psychological discipline, uh, including uh, questions about whether or not children were yelled at, screamed at, uh, called names, um, in terms of physical discipline, um, what the nature of that specific behavior might have been, whether children were shaken, whether they were spanked, whether they were uh, hit with an object or slapped, um, and then um, the specifics for severe physical discipline, which we'll be talking about a little bit separately, are whether children were hit or slapped or uh, hit with an object. Um, so those are the items that we'll be uh, focused on a bit. We also look at another item which has to do with uh, the caregiver's sense of whether or not uh, physical punishment is necessary uh, to bring up or raise children. And you can see the wording of the question, do you believe that in order to bring up, raise, educate uh, the, the child that is the target of the um, survey um, properly, uh, do you need uh, to physically punish him or her? Some other subscales that uh, were of interest to, this, uh, to us in developing the study included um, uh, specific uh, information about psychological maltreatment only, physical maltreatment or um, discipline only, um, both psychological and physical, uh, severe physical, which I mentioned already, and any form of violent discipline. This last category, uh, the, the any form of violent discipline, which includes uh, the four categories above, will be the primary focus of the presentation today. Um, we also have the ability to look at uh, nonviolent uh, discipline and whether um, caregivers only use nonviolent discipline or whether they indicated they use both nonviolent as well as violent discipline. Um, and finally, whether um, they indicated that they weren't providing any form of uh, discipline at, at all. This just gives you, for the countries that we were able to look at, a sense of um, the full range uh, for all of those countries of the indication of whether or not caregivers used any form of violent discipline, including psychological as well as physical. You can see it ranges from a fairly um, uh, modest sort of 40% for Bosnia Herzegovina to uh, close to 95% uh, for Yemen and uh, quite a bit of range in between. For severe physical discipline, um, um, this included uh, uh, the questions around hitting with an object, for example. You can see that the prevalence rates are um, a bit lower, uh, quite a bit lower, actually. Um, and again, uh, quite a wide range of variation in terms of um, indications from caregivers in those countries as to the extent to which uh, severe violent physical discipline was used. And then um, the, um, uh, the next slide sort of depicts the overall percentage of children receiving only or any nonviolent uh, form of physical uh, discipline. You can see from uh, uh, this particular chart that the, the darker blue indicates uh, only nonviolent discipline was being applied uh, in those households. Um, and um, uh, the other and, um, lighter blue indicates both nonviolent as well as violent discipline. So I'm going to switch quickly now to uh, risk and protective factors that are associated uh, with these data. Um, we'll talk about um, uh, lack of resources um, and uh, socioeconomic status, the characteristics of the child, the uh, attitudes about violence, and the caregiver uh, behaviors. So with respect to um, SES and lack of resources, we're talking about family wealth, family education, labor, and number of household members. 
you'll see as we go through these slides that uh, the results are more or less as one might anticipate, but it's important, I think, to be clear that these are, in fact, factors that contribute. Um, we found, for example, that um, uh, wealthier families uh, tended to engage less in violent discipline compared to uh, the poorest 60% of families. So 75% of the wealthiest families engaging in that type of um, disciplinary practice, 77% of the poorest engaging. Um, for family education, um, for non or primary uh, school, 83% um, of caregivers engaged in violent disciplinary um, um, behavior uh, or disciplinary behavior. 78% uh, of those who attended secondary educational programs and 70% uh, of those who attended higher educational programs. For child labor, uh, children who uh, uh, were less involved in child labor uh, were also less likely to um, experience um, severe or, or excuse me, uh, any form of uh, dis uh, physical or psychological violence with respect to disciplinary practices. And for the number of household members, that is the number of individuals who occupy the same household, those households with fewer members, um, one to three in this case, 68% were engaged in violent disciplinary practices, whereas those with six or more, were uh, approximately 80% of those households were engaged in violent disciplinary uh, behaviors. For child characteristics, uh, if we look at child gender and child age, um, there tended to be a, a slighter elevated risk of uh, violent discipline against boys. You can see that 78% um, of uh, indicators uh, for boys compared to 72% for girl children. For child age, uh, this was, I think, one of our more interesting findings. Um, the middle age group, the group between five and nine, was most likely to experience um, violent discipline uh, compared to the two to four year old group and our 10 to 14 year old group. Keep in mind that the survey uh, was specific to this uh, age range, that is two to 14 years, uh, that was defined as the range for which these questions were being asked in the uh, mixed uh, disciplinary module. So we'll turn quickly to attitudes about violence, uh, the belief in the need for uh, violent discipline. Um, I mentioned that earlier when we looked at the items that are in the instrument, and also the specific maternal attitudes uh, with respect to uh, violence. So first of all, the endorsement of uh, belief that physical punishment is necessary and the likelihood of uh, any physical discipline. You can see that there's quite a distinction that uh, among those who did not think that uh, physical discipline was necessary, 53% of households uh, engaged in um, physical uh, punishment, whereas 83% of those who said that they thought it was necessary engaged in that type of physical punishment. So quite a big difference uh, as a result of uh, knowing whether or not a parent believes that physical discipline is necessary. I also provided this information by country so that you could have an idea uh, about what that looked like for uh, children uh, across the various countries that uh, were available for us to take a look at. And then this question asked the question, the question slightly differently. Amongst all of those individuals who responded to the survey who identified themselves as being the child's mother, um, uh, what was their view in terms of justification um, 
of uh, domestic violence and physical discipline. So in other words, if they felt that um, it was reasonable for um, 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 under certain circumstances uh, for women themselves to experience domestic violence, if they felt that that could be justified, um, what was the relationship between that and the likelihood that children might themselves be uh, physically disciplined. And again, you can see that there does appear to be a relationship. 52% uh, of the time those households would engage uh, in physical discipline if the female felt that there was no justification for domestic violence uh, against her person, whereas 63% uh, uh, would engage in um, uh, violent physical discipline uh, if they also felt that domestic violence um, was justified. Um, so caregiver behaviors and educational play activities uh, and also non-adult care were something that we could look at from other items in the survey. One of the things that uh, is of some interest is the idea that um, uh, having more books in the household seems to have some relationship to the uh, reduction of um, uh, the need for uh, violent physical discipline. Uh, again, our sample for this is uh, relatively small, and uh, we were also only looking at children who were under age five. Um, for the same age group, for educational and, and play activities, uh, what we were interested in was whether or not they engaged in educational activities at home, whether they engaged in play, and whether the children had access to toys. And we divided that into three categories uh, in terms of having more or less access uh, to these sorts of activities. Um, as you can see, um, those who had less access were more likely to engage in physical discipline um, compared to those uh, households where there was more access to educational activities and play activities. Non-adult care, um, again for the population of children under five, um, whether or not those children were often left alone um, or uh, with a, another child. And um, you can see that for those households where children were never left without adult supervision, compared to those that uh, were left or more often um, left without adult supervision, that those with less um, or, or who um, uh, didn't receive adult supervision um, uh, were more likely to engage in uh, physical discipline, that the prevalence rate's around 79%, compared to those who uh, always had adult supervision at 64%. So some brief summaries. Um, first of all, there's a clear indication that there's a widespread use of violent discipline, um, that there's a need to look at um, simultaneously focusing on prevention activities that address physical and psychological uh, forms of discipline. Um, there may be some sense that uh, there's a lack of knowledge of alternative uh, parenting no uh, methods. And perhaps most importantly, I think, uh, in terms of uh, longer-term implications programmatically would be can we begin to see some shift in these types of statistics globally um, as um, prevention programs come online in different uh, countries? Um, so we're um, hoping that the ultimate use of the mixed data can not only help us understand prevalence, risk, and protective factors, but also be used to help monitor uh, progress with respect to uh, the reductions in the use or the need for uh, physical discipline. So just briefly, there's some contact information and also the full report uh, is available on the, um, uh, at the link that's identified there. So I'd like to conclude the uh, presentation at this point and turn it back to Candy. Okay, actually, John, I, I'm going to go ahead and forward a couple of questions that came in since they're related to yours. 
Heather Reiser is, is wondering how the items were scored, whether it was traditional scoring and how to interpret the mean scores, and if the difference in some of the statistics are significant. Um, let me see here if I can. Heather, I'm going to unmute you if you, have quest if you want to explain your question a little more. Go ahead and explain your question, which slide specifically you were talking about. Heather, are you there? And there, so, yeah. Kenny, maybe I can just respond. Uh, okay. Um, first of all, the the um, data that I presented um, all represent uh, uh, statistically significant differences by country uh, in those uh, representations. Um, the analysis was done at a country by country level, uh, rather than uh, data being combined across countries. Um, the, um, uh, so all of those results that were statistically significant, taking into account um, the, um, uh, the countries that uh, we were able to incorporate into each of the uh, analyses. They are uh, uh, bivariate representations. In other words, we're only comparing one uh, uh, risk and protective factor at a time to uh, the question of whether or not it was associated with violent discipline. Um, and so uh, some of these factors may be related to each other. For example, the presence of books and income may be highly correlated, and uh, a household's income may be more explanatory than uh, simply the availability of books. Uh, but that was not an analysis that uh, we were able to address um, in this particular report. Um, Kenny, can you repeat the other two questions? Okay. Um... Let's see, the, the other one too, oh, I did have one. Was there any look at intergenerational um, abuse? Um, that's not something that um, is asked as a part of the, the disciplinary module. Um, it's specific to the caregiver who's being asked to respond and uh, a specific child who's the subject of that response. So we don't really have any information about uh, the caregiver's uh, experience with respect to uh, the form of discipline that they experience. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and change over now to Sue Foley. Thank you very much, John. And um, he'll be on at the end if we have more questions around his work. All right. Sue, um, you should have control of the screen now. Okay, Sue, you are unmuted, and um, we're just waiting for your screen to come up. You may have to okay. click show my screen button. I might need to, okay, show my screen, go. There we go. Is it on now? It is on now, thank you. Okay, and um, I, I, have to, I might have the same problem as John in terms of uh, being able to get the whole screen on. i just try it again. Um, hi everyone, my name is Sue Foley and um, I'm from uh, Sydney where it's still dark outside at about uh, 5.38 in the morning. Um, I um, am presenting in this uh, topic in regard to the context of vulnerability. I'm a social worker but I have a particular interest in parenting um, and also a particular interest in education. So um, what I really want to be able to do is um, to explore the way in which we can I guess make some changes for parents and carers in regard to the way that they um, look after children and so that we can look at prevention of harm and perhaps change in terms of uh, disciplinary um, practices. So, um, oh, I'm having trouble getting this to work. Okay, all right, here we go. So, um, 
I work at the Children's Hospital at uh, Westmead in Western Sydney, and um, in that context, I've been involved in a number of projects, including um, shaken baby prevention and other in other uh, parenting um, practices. My interest as a clinician and as an assessor of people who have been um, found to have abused their children in many different ways is that I'm interested in change. And uh, so I hope that I'm going to bring that element of uh, this topic to you. I'm also a bit of a crazy traveller, so you're going to see some of these photos along the way because I, I actually think having a think about metaphors in our interactions with um, clients and with each other um, helps us to uh, take on board some of these ideas. So today I want to look at um, positive parenting at, from a practical way. I'm also interested in um, trying to understand um, the, sorry, I, it's a bit distracting looking at these um, things. I'm going to try the full screen again. Someone's just asked, oh, look at that. How's that? Better? Full screen? Cool. Um, prevent. We want to prevent um, maltreatment and abuse. And we know that, in fact, the cost to organisations is huge. And so we want to uh, see what we can do as communities and as professionals to make a difference. And the hope is that positive and protective parenting and care will reduce the culture of violence. Um, that we know are influenced by multiple sources. Um, I'm going to cover most of these issues around what is vulnerability, what is positive parenting in practice, how does vulnerability of parents impact on, um, uh, on the capacity of parents and carers to parent positively, and when can professionals promote that? When can we make a difference? Um, what do we know about um, trauma and big T and little t trauma? Um, and how that impacts parents and, and creates vulnerability and talk about some examples and all of that in about 20 minutes. So if my uh, Australian accent uh, and my fast talking is too much, please send a message and hopefully I'll be able to read it. So I have a particular interest in, in what I call values-based parenting um, and, or values-based practice, sorry, um, and that is that uh, as a professional I'm interested in social justice, respect for persons and enhancing capacity and competence. Um, competence in parents and competence in ourselves are both pr protective factors um, and these values I think help to um, act as a filter into why am I doing what I'm doing. And this reflective approach is very important when we're dealing with a complex issue that affects us as well as affects the people that we're working with. So this is my little dog, Chloe, who was actually uh, the runt of the litter. And we know that very early on um, in children's lives, when they are small, when they've got um, specific conditions, that they can also be more vulnerable. And Chloe certainly presented with that throughout her life. Um, she's, she never really got over the yapping at night. Um, so what is vulnerability? Um, we do know that low uh, childhood physical abuse risk parents um, are less likely to cause harm to their children. So from, and this is a quote from one of the, uh, a recent journal, um, talking about a parents' ability to interpret ambiguous signals in children. And we know that that interpretation of ambiguous signals or needs takes some focus, takes the capacity to be available and to respond. Um, as I said, I'm a traveller and I'm hoping that you can see uh, this uh, mother bear looking for her baby bear and uh, in fact focus on children's needs and focus on um, the, the whereabouts of children is very important and uh, cute little bears running down the tree trying to find mum, don't go away. Excuse me while I go to my notes because I've lost half my notes because the screen is cut off by the um, response thing. So we know that attachment trauma is a very uh, key aspect of both childhood and adult trauma symptoms and that is that it's not just the event that's the problem, it's the impact on the relationship. It is the lack of relationship that causes difficulties. And so um, part of my proposal is that our parent education, our, our proposal of parenting 
um, can't just be about behaviour, it needs to be attached to an understanding of relationships. Childhood physical abuse is a major concern and we know that it affects the lives of many as one in five um, children. An article um, in uh, the latest edition of um, Child Abuse Review. Um, most survivors have poor neurological outcomes when that's meant to be. Most survivors of um, non-accidental head, head injuries or shaking injuries have poor neurological outcomes. And uh, so the long-term outcomes of physical abuse or physical harm of any kind are, are, are not good. They're very poor. We know that um, parents and older siblings are the primary source of positive parenting and well-being for children. So these people need to be our target group in looking at positive parenting program. Um, this, this, while, while this is a very tricky kind of medium for having uh, interactive, uh, I know that we're hoping that um, the information that you provide will contribute to a, you know, some information for all of us, a document. So uh, the question I wanted to put on for you is what do you think um, early vulnerability does and what is early vulnerability? And if you could just um, put a note on, even on the, um, the chat list and then that can be captured later on in our um, report of this seminar. Um, I'll probably hopefully have time to deal with questions at the end but on the meantime I'd also ask you to ask you know is, is attachment um, disruption or physical harm or problematic? What do you think? So just to quickly list what I've understood to be the issues of vulnerability in children and young people, age and development, babies are particularly vulnerable to physical harm, um, but, but all, all groups can be too. I've seen in my clinical practice, you know, up to adolescence with significant physical injuries. Um, all children are vulnerable to emotional and psychological abuse, sexual abuse and neglect of, various, um, of their various needs. Attachment illness or abuse trauma can create complex impacts. By that I mean, you know, someone who works in a hospital, I see children who've had um, illness, significant illness, brain injury or other kind of metabolic illnesses that actually make interaction with parents and carers very problematic. They're more irritable and so therefore they are more at risk. Illness or injury um, creates particular features and managing irritability and distress can be difficult if parents are also expressing that. Um, other challenges include things like learning difficulties and uh, in my mental health practices I've been uh, you know, very um, concerned about issues around uh, children being able to process what they are being spoken to about or how they're being interacted, emotional processing and verbal processing, things that seem to me to be basic issues and yet they get they get missed by parents, school teachers and, and create risk for these children because they don't understand and they're not understood. And then of course there's the parental uh, vulnerability issues and these are um, persistent and acute conflict in the home and uh, the impact of domestic violence has really hit the media here in Australia and I think uh, where you know while the research has shown that that's uh, a serious issue um, we're not all that good at figuring out what the heck is going to be helpful for um, families to be safe for their children. Parental illness, physical illness also creates difficulties for parents in being positive, may increase irritability, may increase lack of focus on the child and not with any intention of harm but certainly um, creating risk for children. As um, parental intellectual and other disability, many services in Australia um, struggle to work with um, uh, families where parental um, difficulties make it hard for them to negotiate services and understand the basics of um, parenting skills. It doesn't mean there isn't capacity but I've just been stunned that somehow there's an expectation that one size will fit all. Um, past and present substance abuse or substance use. Um, sometimes, you know, I see people in my clinic practice and it just is very concerning that those parents really struggle um, to 
be able to interpret signals, interpret signs and respond to the list of, of options that they may have. Um, past trauma, you know, mums who tell me that the worst thing that happened to their, them was losing their mum when they were 16 and they're now 46. Um, past trauma of their own that they've never really had a chance to talk about or they've used the, um, the option of putting that, that story behind them. And then of course environmental difficulties and we, we know that for um, many families, poverty, housing, extended family pressures, culture, status, um, difficulties that impact on the parents' ability to be safe parents. Um, for example, I had a family where um, you know, their, their housing was so bad, there was four children and the parents in the one room and they were living with extended family who wanted the children quiet. That kind of pressure increased the likelihood of difficulties um, for parents to be positive parents and to contribute to the overall well-being of the children. Um, the other bit that uh, is very important is the issue of, of child development knowledge. While there's some kind of expectation that if you have children that you understand their needs, um, in fact that's not the case. That for some people their lack of knowledge about babies, about the dangers of shaking, about the need for supervision and the need for not leaving children with people who are um, more irritable, more likely to respond um, negatively to their children creates problems. So um, what does uh, positive parenting look like? And uh, I was playful in my mind thinking about what attunement is. And positive parenting does need to have a level of attunement, a high level. And attunement is like a dance or a rhythm between babies or children, uh, parents or other caregivers. Positive parenting means uh, recognising and planning to meet the multiple needs of children of all ages within the relevant cultural context and then responding to those needs safely and without causing harm. It's also about parents being able to be mindful and in our very busy world that can be very tricky. Um, positive parenting is nice. I couldn't figure out a better word to use but it, it feels nice. It is pleasant. It's, it's, uh, it produces joy um, for children and parents and it is protective. Positive parenting presumes that negative parents, that is lots of no's, don'ts, buts, controlling and negative attributions for the child, are, um, is very bad for children and parents. It's not, not a nice um, way of being. It's, it also um, requires some re flexibility and responsibility that parents see themselves as the repairers, um, wise, loving, purposeful and awake able to ensure the safety and well-being of the children. And in my clinical population, I'm always a bit stunned really that um, parents don't, parents believe the children need to do the repair work rather than that they need to be the repair work. And of course, a very important aspect is that parents have the role of helping children to self-regulate um, and interact appropriately with other people and with uh, their parents. So um, positive parenting education or capacity building can take a lot of forms um, and it really needs to be accessible both in its form and its process. Um, positive parenting education needs to address those issues that I've just mentioned, their beliefs about children, self-awareness and the triggers that their involvement with children creates. Um, and in my view, this is the, this is the uh, key issue for, for today, for me from a practical point of view. All of us who work clinically and in fact all of us who have anything to do with the world out there have a responsibility to incorporate respectfully and naturally into as many interactions with children and parents as possible, some positive parenting, some positive interactions. Um, and I know this sounds simple but you know we're often a bit um, anxious about um, making comments positive or negative and uh, it's, it's very important that in our world today the, the dominant negative culture is not the one that reigns. So the kind of opportunities are, that we have for influencing positive parenting is these kind of webinars, hearing the information such as uh, from tomorrow's webinar and John Fluke's um, data which will influence our interactions such as in clinic visits and home visits through advocacy, media, social media. Um, and in our own family settings, 
um, in education settings and at vulnerable times. For example, when children come with their parents for health assessments, um, when they're being monitored or when there's other kinds of um, clinical interactions. And also that um, uh, through things like social media, our hospital's actually taken to using uh, their Facebook page and other things to try and get um, positive parenting messages out and in conversations. Um, and I put this comment, um, my mother doesn't hit me because um, I, as a parent, this is the personal thing, um, my daughter used to go to, go, when she was at, my mother doesn't hit me. And people in shops would say, really, you must be very good. And Elise would say, um, no, um, I just have to go to my room and think about it for a bit. Um, and I, I know that that sounds very naive, but we often need little catchphrases, things to actually help um, parents to and children to understand uh, our, our discipline, inverted commas. So parenting programs are well recognised in terms of a, an intervention, uh, or re also recognised in terms of the research as a, a source of prevention and protection. Um, they do seek to address gaps in attachment uh, and address knowledge and skills gaps, but sometimes they're very directive and sometimes they can be quite patronising when in fact we like them to more than sometimes be empowering. So um, specifically I think that uh, vulnerability can increase impulsivity and reactivity of parents and teachers and other carers. It may inhibit reflection. So they, the overwhelming emotional state and confusion um, can inhibit effective thinking. And we know that actually um, being mindful and proactive is very important for positive parenting. Um, some of the parents I have talk about sensitivity to the noise and the day-to-day -day demands of caring for the children. And when they present as overwhelmed, then they find it very difficult to respond in a positive way. And it, it's, I put, may increase the possibility of physical harm and neglect, and it certainly will increase um, the likelihood of negative versus positive parenting. Um, so stress, disempowerment, and overwhelming emotions inhibit this cognitive capacity. It may also reduce the capacity of a parent to act as an advocate when they're having to deal with schools around things like their children having learning difficulties or some other kind of condition that needs support. And positive parenting, in my view, means that parents need to be able to be advocates for their children. Um, it may also increase uh, a sense that the baby's cry or a children's needs a punishment or they're being targeted or may increase a parent's view that they are a bad parent. So um, that therefore will in decrease the likelihood of capacity to interact in a positive way. So we know that vulnerability also affects um, the brains of children and parents and the new science of neurobiology of parents uh, raises our awareness and the scientific and clinical community of things like mirror neurons. Um, the importance of attachment and repair, the importance of interpersonal communication um, amongst all family members, and the importance of recognising complex elements in the layers of meaning of behaviours, and the, the impact of early trauma from health and accidents to exposures to disasters. And we know that those things do affect people's brains and affect their ability to function. The science is very complex, um, and in order for it to become part of the positive the parenting matrix or the communications that we have as clinicians and researchers, um, we need to have a better understanding of its impact in our practice in various disciplines. Um, I've asked down here if you um, have got uh, any thoughts about this to add your thoughts about the contributions of this science to the issue of positive parenting uh, research and practice. So um, how can we address vulnerability and in this context in order to prevent harm and promote well-being. So uh, the Shaken Baby project in Sydney that I've been involved in um, started about uh, maybe 12, maybe 11 years ago. And uh, we had a number of key, key messages in that project which, have, which has been validated um, internationally. And the project starts with um, sort of a business statement, no matter how upset you feel, shaking your baby is not, just not the deal. Um, 
that it's important to self-calm, take a breath, stop and think. We also like to promote the idea that children are not little adults, that they're going to feel and react differently to circumstances and to interactions. That it's important for um, parents to not feel they have to do it on their own, but to connect with others, to try some new ideas, to ask for help, pick up the phone. And our film's got a sort of a sing-song narrative to it, which interestingly in the neurobiological literature talks about interactions um, uh, having more effect when we use some of that sing-song um, storytelling type model. Sometimes direct statements need to be made um, in, and need to be made in respectful ways. Um, things like don't hit, which can be a bit controversial, don't shake, don't ask too many questions of children because that we then expect perhaps an answer that's our answer and not theirs. Don't get too close to children in distress. Um, talk quietly, slowly and not too much. And um, I've named a few people in here mainly because they're my favourites that I'm actually using at the moment. And uh, there is no, let me just say, there's no actual um, reason, no conflict in this uh, for me. I have no investment in these products, but I have been using them and I'm offering them as my thoughts. And I'm hoping that you'll add yours as well to contribute to this. So um, just briefly to say that it's important that when we're doing interactions and assessments and even research that we don't ignore the significant issues that are raised in this slide, the impact on parents of those components of vulnerability that I've mentioned already. Um, and also that we recognise that positivity and negativity um, some are in conflict um, and sometimes a, a negative bias is what happens when people are vulnerable and are struggling. And uh, this is Dr. Bruce Perry um, speaking about the, the bias that exists in the brain when survival is being challenged and that's a vulnerability component. So um, we know the risks that um, when there is risk of harm or neglect or inadequate opportunity to achieve development uh, targets and problems with attention or self-regulation and sleeping, all of these things can create a, ne a negative and a punitive cycle between parent and child. And in my view, from a clinical point of view, um, positive parenting education needs to know those things and address them and not just have a, you know, a basic behavioural component. Um, there is no one program that works for all groups um, and some individuals and families will need multiple interventions and I don't know about elsewhere in the world but that's sometimes an issue here where people think that um, only one program is going to work for all. Um, vulnerability in children, parents and the community require positive parenting education that acknowledges and affirms parents and their situations without ignoring inhibiting factors. Children need a community. So just some examples and I, I'd really like you to add some, some of your favourites, some ones that you've used, some ones that you know have been um, uh, validated so that we can have them as part of our um, the response to this think tank. Um, so I've suggested things like Triple P, 123 Magic, PCIT, um, and there's some other resources such as Raising Children Network and some online resources which, are, which will be on the end of these slides when they're posted on the web as well. Many of the programs have been found to be effective, um, but the question needs to keep on being asked. Are they just, are they effective for um, the same, all population? Populations or do vulnerable parents and children need a, a moderated program? Do they need different ways? And we know that the research, for example, I think, I hope I'm not quoting them wrong, but period of the Purple Crying program talks about at least three doses of education. So they talk about doing it around the baby's um, birth, they talk about a follow-up at the paediatricians and they follow up, they talk about um, community, providing education in the community very important that there's not just one dose of education. None of us remembers things the first time. The other problem is that sometimes uh, practice needs to be more than um, just hearing. It needs to be coached or it needs to be supported. The relationship needs to be supported between the parent and the child and for that to happen, the parent needs a relationship with someone to support them in you, adding new information into their system. 
So um, we've had a researcher, um, Dr. Melissa Kaltner, who's helped with um, evaluating parent education and thinking about that in terms of a Shaken Baby project. And in fact, um, the data on it is that uh, parent education as prevention of physical harm has very mixed messages in terms of the research outcomes. Um, and we know that in general, the problem of knowledge into practice is very tricky. Um, it's not always consistently applied. It's very difficult to maintain um, good application of knowledge into practice, especially where there's vulnerability or something inhibiting um, appropriate uh, application. And then um, seeing this mon managed. So this is me as a cute little girl. Um, as child protection professionals, we want to enhance children's safety, welfare and well-being. My second hypothesis is that parents need to be our collaborators. And sometimes in clinical work um, and even in research work, parents are not considered to be collaborators. Somehow there's a power differential. Um, promoting unconditional positive regard from a parent to the child is very important to promote um, protective behaviour rather than um, increased stress. So this is a postcard from our film uh, which basically uh, suggests to parents that they need to uh, ask for help. So um, in terms of negative attributions, I, 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 you know, um, in clinical populations, the child is often presented as the problem. And in our Shaken Baby project, uh, the study showed that parents and professionals who saw crying as naughty or bad or spoilt in little babies, just really important that uh, we have a, a good construct around that and what are the opportunities we have to challenge that in parenting uh, education. Um, domestic violence, as I, as I mentioned, this is a new book which is hard to get but comes from the States. Uh, my name is Trauma and it just gives a really nice picture of, of one particular component of vulnerability but a very big component I think um, because of the place of domestic violence. It, it inhibits learning and courage and reflection and creates um, vulnerable parents and vulnerable children. Education that works needs to be engaging, enjoyable, motivating and enhancing of competence. This is an example of advocacy, um, getting things into the media, addressing attitudes and priorities out there in the big picture. Uh, parents are the brain builders of children and parent education and parent coaching is just essential. Um, and I think that the, there are three things that I've, um, I've uh, noticed up there, particular child care, caring skills with emotional and verbal interactions that are positive and enhancing self-esteem, parent self-regulation skills and parent-child development skill knowledge. So inviting parents to consider that the change and knowledge that they need is an important strategy for them, that it's actually nicer to learn some of these skills and to enjoy being in interaction with their children. Uh, and, and you know, I think in the community we can sometimes have an influence. So um, there was a man on a shopping centre nearby and he was managing his struggling toddler while he was hanging onto the phone. And there's been some discussion here about can you parent while you're on the phone. Um, and uh, using my best sing-song polite voice, I said, oh, it might be a bit easy if you didn't have the phone to your ear. And he looked at me. <gasps> bit surprised, I think, that someone had challenged him, but, but he said, oh yeah, right, and uh, thank you for that. So um, some of my colleagues think I was a bit of a nut to do that, but uh, you know, I think if we can figure out ways in which we can have these conversations, we may be able to enhance positive parenting. Um, and uh, you know, we need to actually help with the skills and knowledge of parents. So um, if we're focusing on uh, trauma, if somebody has got a past traumatic history, it's very difficult for them to take on these new ideas. And parents with a trauma history, their own experience of being parented or previous parenting issues um, may find it very hard. So I've just uh, put up here some, some of the resources. The, uh, the Whole Brain Child and Parenting from the Inside Out have been very uh, received here, although I have to say that um, I'm glad there's a DVD because uh, I find the book very difficult. Um, to read a bit dense for me, but so for parents who are vulnerable, it's even more difficult. Um, 
but there are many programs that can be adapted to the needs of vulnerable parenting and take the blame and the shame out of parenting. And some of these uh, more ideas, pace and pride, um, there are statements that can be used in advertising, um, positive parenting on Facebook and playful positive parenting can create smiles. So um, I think it's really important that we promote um, achievements with parents and engage with them. Um, whenever we're involved with them because I think we can change the world um, clinically and in our interactions as members of the community. So in conclusion, it's really important that we keep it real, that uh, positive parenting will have positive results for the parent, the child and the community and in vulnerable situations, special attention needs to be paid to the impact of vulnerability on the implementation and encouraging of positive parenting approaches. Um, so uh, thank you for joining and participating and uh, I've put some more questions, a couple more questions up there so that uh, if you have some answers you might like to contribute to this um, think tank. Um, what have you used in terms of parenting programs? What have you found to be effective and what ideas do you have to enhance positive parenting in the, co in the uh, context of vulnerability? And these are just some of the resources that I have um, and in particular um, there's an Ispikan e-learning course called Communicating About Violence and uh, I haven't, Peter Andreasen actually spoke at one of the recent Ispikan conferences and I was very impressed with his um, perspective on the need to speak to the amygdala, not just speak to the cognition. So um, there's some other resources, some freebies, this is a, some freebies on the web, our project and another wonderful one for bringing out the best in your baby and it's free as well. And uh, these things will actually be on the web soon. So that's the end for me. Thank you very much, Sue. We appreciate it. And uh, we're now going to try to see if we can get Joan back on again. Let's see. Okay. All right. Whoops, John. Are you able to see my screen? I can hear you without an echo. I haven't seen your screen yet. Be sure to click the show my screen button at the top I of your have, yes. oh, it'll it'll pop it, up in a second. Is it up yet? Not yet. Anyway, everyone, we do apologize for our earlier technical problems. It's good to hear that Joan is able to talk now, and um, hopefully we'll see her screen in just a second here. Well, first of all, whilst you're waiting for my screen, has it come up yet? No, not yet. Oh, dear. Um... Right. Let's try again. I want to just thank, though, uh, both Sue Foley and John Fluke for their presentations. Um, I've clicked all the necessary buttons and it is uh, launching um, and should come up soon. Um, and I apologize first of all for not being uh, able to talk to you at the beginning of the presentation. Um, oh, well, we have Joan's presentation now and but some, let's try this again. Joan, can Thank we, you. there we go, can hear you again, lost you for a second. And we do see your presentation. Right. Okay. Okay, um, I just want to say that this is a, um, a project of ISPICAN, so I'm just going to take you through the uh, presentation. This should have come at the beginning of the webinar, and I apologize that it's very back to front. But just first of all, to introduce ISPICAN, we are um, a worldwide organization, a membership organization. Our mission is to support individuals and organizations working to protect children from all forms of abuse and uh, neglect worldwide. 
We were founded in 1977 by Henry Kemp. Um, and it's still the only multidisciplinary organization bringing together professionals worldwide to work towards the prevention of child abuse, neglect, and exploitation globally. Um, I'm not going to go through all the objectives, but I am going to refer you to our website, which you can see in the bottom left-hand corner. And all of you, I think, registered for this particular webinar uh, through the website. So you can go back to the website to revisit the objectives. And also just to mention that the, there are a variety of membership benefits. They're dependent on the category of uh, membership that you take out. Uh, probably the one that um, I find most valuable at the moment is the subscription to child abuse and neglect which um, has now a range of articles, um, not just the kind of purest science, scientific article, but um, certainly articles that have assisted me enormously in my practice. Um, and I'm sure many of you will find that and the other membership benefits useful. Just to tell you about the Denver Thinking Space, because that's really the, what you are participating in tonight. The aim of the Denver Thinking Space is to bring international experts together, because we need to look at specific challenges that are actually experienced with, uh, worldwide. We need to share theory, research, and evidence-based practice on some topics. Um, and then from this sharing across the globe, we develop a, a, a report which provides us with high-level clinical and policy advice. It aims to be multicultural, multilingual, and multidisciplinary, universally applicable or adaptable across language and culture, sensitive to the realities of resources, because ISPCAN covers both developed and developing countries, and all countries, developed or otherwise, have challenges with resources. And we try and make it a practical resource for the use of senior practitioners um, hoping to influence policymakers, senior officials in their own geographical and cultural areas. In 2011, we looked at the sexual abuse of children, and there is a very fascinating report, interesting and useful, on our website on the 2011 Denver Thinking Space. Um, 2013, we looked, as a result of the first Denver Thinking Space, we realized the importance of looking at working with men and boys as a means of preventing the sexual abuse of children. Also, that report is on the website. But this particular year, we're addressing positive parenting, preventing violence against children through positive parenting. And what is interesting is there is beginning to be a, a small but growing body of knowledge and research that indicates that perhaps positive pairing not, parenting not only is important for the protection of children, but in the longer term may contribute to breaking the cycle of interpersonal violence in later childhood and early adulthood. The, so the aim of this particular Denver Thinking Space is to gather global views on what constitutes positive parenting. And thank you, Sue, for maybe this just as as well you came for me because you gave many examples of your thinking around positive parenting. Um, and we also want to gather information on evidence-based programs that promote positive parenting and re reduce violence against children. That's what we want to see, those programs that actually do result in a reduction of all forms of violence against children. And we would also like to know, um, are there programs that people are beginning to initiate, have initiated, have developed an evidence base for, or evidence is, is building and appears to be positive in terms of does positive parenting and raising children without violence reduce into personal violence in other relationships and contexts? And then once we've gathered this information, we will produce and disseminate a report on the findings. Um, the process began uh, at the Global Institute, held on the 25th of January this year at the San Diego Child Maltreatment Conference. Um, we've completed a concept paper, which is on our website, and I do invite you all to read it, and a questionnaire. And of course, most importantly, 
we'd really like participants in this webinar to complete the questionnaire. If you have ideas, programs that you are using, particularly those that have an evidence base on positive parenting. So this is the first in two webinars. <clears throat> we will be sending you the questionnaire. We do hope we'll get it back. We're also going to have a virtual internet discussion between March 25th and April 1st. And we invite you um, to participate in this. And we will be having workshops uh, at the regional conferences that we are holding this year in Toluca, Bucharest, and Kuala Lumpur. And then from all of these activities, we'll develop our final report. It will be on our website next year. So we want your input. We'll send you the questionnaire. Please return it to the address. Um, and because my presentation will also be put on the website, you will be able to take this address off uh, our website. Parenting is actually historically neglected in child abuse prevention strategies. More attention has been paid historically to efforts to teach children to protect themselves, acquire skills to deal with situations in which they might be at risk. Um, but there is a growing body of evidence that building skills for positive parenting protects children within the family system from violence. And as I've already said, there is some evidence that building skills for positive parenting may even break the cycle of interpersonal violence across uh, generations. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of Marta Santos Paz, the UN Spe Special Representative um, for the Secretary General on Violence Against Children. And she stated at the ISPCAN conference last year in Japan, the family plays a critical role in violence prevention and in the protection of young children. Family love, affection, sorry, Family love, affection, and supportive advice helps children develop trust and confidence and nurtures their self-esteem and promotes a growing sense of responsibility that gives competence to overcome challenges and resolve disputes without resorting to violent means. <clears throat> Providing a nurturing environment for children in early years and supporting families and caregivers in their child-rearing responsibilities is critical to child development and protection from violence. We all, I am sure, have read some of the uh, studies on adverse childhood experiences. Sue Foley also mentioned the impact on children of negative parent experiences with parents. And they conclude that abuse and neglect during childhood may have long-lasting and severe impacts on both later childhood and adult functioning. So the focus on prevention of violence against children has, uh, now that we're beginning to focus in a more scientific way on prevention of violence, of uh, prevention of violence against children, it's identified the importance of working with parents and caregivers. And I actually want to repeat something that Sue had said, because I've made a note of it to mention this evening, and that is we need to actually regard parents as partners in our child protection activities. Um, not just clients. Um, by regarding them as partners, we empower them to parent better. And we also need to look at uh, parenting and uh, the work with parents in terms of the prevention of violence from both primary, secondary, and tertiary preventive activities. Services to parents and caregivers should include all three levels. We should be working with parents who have not come to the attention of child protection organizations, but in a very broad way. We should look at parents and be working with parents who have already ident been identified as being at risk. And we should also be working with those parents who have, in fact, harmed their children in some way in order to prevent further harm to those children and promote healing. What is interesting is if you read the general comment on Article 19 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is the Child Protection Article, 
Um, Article 19 recognizes the primary position of families, including extended families, in child caregiving and the protection and prevention of violence. The flip side of that, of course, is that the committee also recognizes that the majority of violence takes place in the context of families and that intervention and support are therefore required when children become victims of hardship and distress imposed on or generated in families. The World Study on Violence Against Children also recognized the family as the natural environment for the growth and well-being and socialization of all its members, but, and recognized also that the family has the greatest potential to protect children and provide for their care, their protection, their physical, their emotional safety. But the report also noted that the privacy and autonomy of the family are valued in all societies and the right to privacy in home life is guaranteed in international human rights instruments. And therefore eliminating and responding to violence against children is perhaps most challenging in the context of the family because it's a very private sphere. UNICEF published two very interesting uh, uh, books, booklets last year based on research that they had done on violence against children. The second one was called Ending Violence Against Children, Six Strategies for Action. Their very first uh, point was that there should be support for parents, caregivers and families. I won't go through their other points, but all of them related to parenting and child caregiving. So we need to debate what is positive parenting, an attitude towards child rearing, behavior management approaches and methods. It's not just a ban on corporal punishment. It's all of the above and much more. Positive parenting is parental behavior that responds to the rights and best interests of the child, the Positive parent nurtures, empowers, and guides children, recognizing them as individuals in their own right. Positive parenting is not permissive parenting. It sets boundaries that children need to develop in order to achieve their full potential. And a key part of positive parenting is raising children in a nonviolent environment. And that's from the Council of Europe. Again, positive parenting, Sue actually mentioned these things in her slide. I'm not going to reread this slide. But what we do need to do is develop an evidence base for those parent education programs that can be applied across contexts, across cultures, or maybe we need to look at the fact that for, within some cultures and contexts, we need parenting programs that are specifically designed for context and culture. And this is part of what this study is about. So in conclusion, I just want to mention the home is the first context of learning for children. There is a growing evidence base to support positive parenting as a primary prevention strategy for reducing violence against children and breaking the cycle of violence across generations. And what we really want from you, and I'm thanking you in advance, is your, your returned questionnaire with your ideas about what positive parenting is about and how it can be supported, not just in the child protection field, but by practitioners in broader contexts. Um, and we want to hear across the globe, no matter where you are, whether you're in a developing country, whether perhaps it's a specific cultural practice, we want to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Joan, very much. Um, I am going to uh, take Joan off of being the presenter at the moment because I just want this, this is Candace with this scan. I just want you to um, take a look. This can will be hosting a virtual issues discussion from now through April 1st to discuss positive parenting. This is available only to ISPCAN members. And, but we would encourage you to go online. Here are the, the details about how to take part in this discussion. And a virtual issues discussion is, is sort of like, uh, like the way we've been using the chat box. It gives people a chance to talk and discuss things uh, over time so that even though you may not be awake when someone is posting in another part of the world, you'll see their, their comment and then you can make um, 
answers back to that. So anyway, we do want to thank you all for being part of this. We will be sending you the questionnaire that we hope you will complete, as well as the concept paper. And all of the PowerPoint presentations today you will be able to find on the ISPCAN website. I don't know if, uh, I don't think I had uh, questions to go. So I think I'm just going to wrap it at this point. It is 1.30, and again, we thank you all. We do apologize. It's our very first one ever, so we've learned a few things today. Um, good night, and have a good day for those of you who are just starting your day.